are we are trying out something new with this program, so I'm learning as I go. All right, and we are live on Facebook. All right, excellent. Well, welcome to everybody joining us on Zoom and on Facebook. I'm glad you all could make it today. I'm Tim from Fontenelle Forest. So um, I'm coming to you live from right here in Bellevue, Nebraska, where it is a kind of a cloudy day, um, but hopefully things will get a little bit nicer. Um, so we're gonna talk about bats today. Um, I, I love bats. I don't know about you. We, I had a poll going earlier. It looked like we had a lot of people that liked bats, a few people that didn't, but bats are often kind of feared and a little bit misunderstood. So bats, um, you know, one myth that there is about bats is that they fly into your hair. So I'm gonna bust that myth right now. Bats will not fly into your hair. Um, bats are exceptionally um, good flyers. They're very maneuverable. And I, I promise you they won't fly into your hair. Um, but we want to try to understand bats and maybe with a little bit of understanding, maybe people won't dislike bats so much. And you know, one, of the, one good reason to try and understand bats is they are the second largest order of mammals on the planet. So about 20% of all mammals on the planet are bats. So there's a lot of them. There's about 1100 different species and they make up about 20% of all mammal species on the planet. So, you know, if for no other reason, there's a lot of them. So we might as well try to, to understand them and get along with them. And, and they do provide us with a lot of benefits. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that <clears throat> in a little bit. Now, bats have been around as a species for quite a while. So the oldest known fossils date back to over 55 million years ago. So that's, that's quite a ways. And the best fossils come from the Messel pits in Germany. These are oil shale pits. And bats generally don't fossilize well. Their bones are very delicate. And it's estimated that only about 12% of bat species have been found in the fossil record. But those from the Messel pits are, are extremely well preserved. Um, they often show the outline of fur, of their ears, and of their wing membranes. And like I said, um, their bones are very delicate. So I'm going to show you here. This is a, a bat skeleton. Make sure I get it in the camera. And you can see how delicate those bones are, those fine little bones of their wings. And those are actually like fingers. Now, just like with birds, the ability to fly has let bats colonize almost every area of the world. Now, bats don't live in the Arctic or Antarctic, but with those two exceptions, bats are found worldwide. And they generally roost in caves or crevices, um, hollow trees, the foliage of trees. Um, they also, as we know, like man-made structures. So they will they will roost in mines, quarries, um, attics, garages, sheds, kind of anywhere where they won't be disturbed. Um, under bridges is a popular place for them. Um, there are about 45 different species of bat found in the US. Um, the most common are the little brown bat, the big brown bat, and the Mexican free-tailed bat. Um, the three most common in Nebraska are the big brown bat, the little brown bat, and the red bat. We have about 13 different species that we'll call Nebraska home for at least part of the year. Now bats do share some traits. So bats are mammals. So they, they have fur, they bear live young, which then nurse from their mothers. Um, and they are the only true flying mammal. So other, other mammals like flying squirrels, they don't truly fly, they glide. So they're more like a paper airplane, um, but a bat is the actual only true flying mammal. And flight um, in animals has actually only evolved four times in recorded history. And those are, in addition to the bat, birds, of course, we know birds can fly, insects, insects can fly, 
and then pterosaurs, which are dinosaurs, which we don't have around anymore. So bats can be can fly very quickly. Uh, the Mexican free-tailed bat can achieve speeds of up to 100 miles an hour. So that's that's moving. And most bats can get up to at least 60. That's now, awesome. bats are extremely long-lived as a species. They live about three and a half times longer than other animals of the same size. And there's a, a couple of um, theories on why that is. One is that it might be due to decreased predation because they fly and they're nocturnal. So flying and being nocturnal keeps you safe from predators. Um, hibernating, so they slow down their metabolism in cold weather. And so that, that slowing of the metabolism may actually help increase their lifespan. Living in caves, so cave dwelling bats actually live longer than non cave dwelling bats. And this again might be a, a result of reduced predation. So those caves are safer places to roost. They're safe from predators. Um, hanging upside down. Um, almost all bats hang upside down. And again, this is a way of, of keeping safe from predators. It, it reduces the predation. Now, most bats are nocturnal. And most bats spend a lot of time hanging upside down. Now, there are exceptions to those rules, but um, there are about six species of bat worldwide that don't hang upside down. So there are, there are exceptions. There are diurnal bats. The diurnal means out during the day. So there are some bats that come out during the day. But for the most part, the majority of bat species are, are nocturnal or, or, and they hang upside down. And then different species of bat have different um, diets and different hunting strategies. And we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about that in a second. Now, these are our largest and smallest of the bat species. So the largest is the flying fox here on the left. Um, they, they get up to about three pounds and can have a wingspan of up to about five and a half feet. So that's, that's pretty big. Uh, but these are fruit bats. So, Nothing to fear here. They're not gonna. They're not gonna suck your blood. They're not gonna, you know, steal your dog or your cat. They eat fruit and they live in the tropical rainforest, uh, generally in the Philippines and kind of East Asia area. Over here on the right, we have the the smallest bat, the bumblebee bat. The official name is the kitty's hognose bat, and they are actually the smallest mammal in the world based on skull size. They get up to about two grams. So, you know, think about a couple of pennies in weight. Um, they are about 1.3 inches long. And they live in limestone caves along the rivers of West Thailand and, My and Southeast Myanmar. So they, they live overseas. But I think that bumblebee bat's kind of cute. Look at that little face. How can you not love that little face? Now, bats are very social. So some species, well, some species are solitary. Some species live in colonies that can number up into the millions. So in, in temperate regions, they, even solitary bats, they may swarm together um, at hibernation sites. So they may overwinter in quarries or mines or caves, and they may be solitary most of the year, but gather together in a big colony in order to hibernate. And again, living in large colonies is another way to reduce the risk of predation. So they, by living in a large colony, a large group, it's like, Kind of like herd immunity. I'm sure you've heard the term herd immunity lately, but you know, having all those bats around means if a predator comes around, each individual bat is a little bit safer because it could always be somebody else that gets eaten. The largest bat colony in the world is actually right here in the United States. It's called Bracken Cave, and it's located um, in Texas, about 20 minutes south of San Antonio. And in that cave live about 20 million Mexican free bats. I'm going to show you a, a short video here. Oh, no. <laughs>
pretty amazing. All right, let's see. I'm trying to make it so, let's see. So I had a couple of questions here. One was, um, I'm hoping everybody is just seeing me now. I tried to turn off the gallery view. Um, somebody said, why do we call it the bumblebee bat? And I think that's just because it's so small. It's a tiny little, little bumblebee bat. Um, let's see, do bats migrate to the south like birds? That's an excellent question. I'm actually going to talk about that. Some bats migrate, some bats don't. So we'll talk about that in just a second. So adaptations. So diet. Let's talk about bat diets. So mega bats, which are our larger bats, um, eat mostly fruit. So they eat fruit, nectar, and pollen. They're, the technical term for that is frugivores. So due to their size and metabolism, they need to eat about twice their body weight per day. Um, they like ripe fruit, they'll pull it off with their teeth, they'll fly to their roost, they'll, they'll suck out the juice, and they'll spit out the seeds and pulp. And this is, this is actually very beneficial to the plants because um, that a lot of times helps them regenerate. So the, they're spitting out the pulp and the fruit and it's mixing with the bat guano. Bat guano is a wonderful fertilizer and that helps those plants regenerate. Nectar feeding bats are adapted to, to drinking um, from flowers, almost like hummingbirds. They, have, they generally have a longer snout, a very long tongue, and they can reach into those flowers and, and lap up the pollen. And then a lot of those flowers actually depend on bats. There's about 500 species of flower that open at night just because the bats help, help them pollinate. Now that does come with a little bit of a drawback um, nectar feeding bats are very highly specialized and because of that, they're not very adaptable. If there's a drought, if there's a lack of food, they're not as able to switch to other sources of food as some of the other bats. Now our micro bats or our smaller uh, bats, they eat mostly insects, they're insectivores. So now they need to consume about 120% of their body weight per day and they can eat um, over 600 insects an hour. This is one of the reasons I like them. They love mosquitoes. So they can eat a whole lot of mosquitoes during the night. And they're welcome to come to my backyard and eat as many mosquitoes as they can get their, their mouths around. So they usually catch them in midair with their mouth. Um, some species may um, glean them from vegetation. So, um, or they'll hunt from a perch. Um, I, I just had a question, um, what made the bats leave the cave? Um, those bats were leaving that cave because it was, it was getting dark. So they, were, they had been roosting during the day and they were heading out to feed. Um, some, speaking of feeding, some bats will actually eat vertebrates. So they'll eat things like frogs. They can track the frogs by their mating call and, and they'll, they'll swoop down and they'll grab them with their teeth and eat the frogs. They also, um, some will actually eat fish. They'll eat small fish. And using echolocation, which we're gonna get into in a little bit, um, they can detect ripples on the surface of the water. So they can detect those ripples. They know a fish is, is near the surface and they'll swoop down and they'll, they'll grab them um, with their feet and return to their roost. And yes, there are species of bat that drink blood. Now we don't have any of those in Nebraska. Um, those tend to, to go towards bigger prey anyways. They, they will lap the blood from, from cattle. They don't suck them dry like you see in the movies. Um, they usually make a, a small puncture that the, the animal hardly even feels, and then they lap the blood from that. Um, and there's, there's also species that will feed on bird blood. Um, I have a question about how many predators bats have. We're gonna, we're gonna get to that. I promise you right about now, actually. So 
Bats are, are well known for hanging upside down. And most bats spend the majority of their time um, hanging upside down. They, they will sleep this way, they'll eat this way, they mate, they nurse their young, they raise their young, um, almost exclusively hanging upside down except for when they're out hunting and flying. So there's a couple of advantages to, to hanging upside down. One is it's easier for them to take off. Um, birds have a lot of lift with their wings. It's easy for them to take off from the ground. Um, bats have a harder time doing it. So by hanging upside down, all they have to do is let go and they're in the air and they can fly. Um, again, this is also a way to avoid predators. It's harder for a predator um, to get at them this way. Now I had a question about how many predators bats have. They actually have quite a few. So some of our nocturnal hunting birds will eat them. Um, some hawks, uh, owls, uh, things like that. Um, also other animals, anything that would would prey on something else, um, ring-tailed cats, foxes, um, raccoons, anything that could get at them would potentially eat them. Now, if, if I were to hang upside down from a tree, um, all the blood would rush to my head, I'd get a bad headache. Bats don't have that problem. They have, they have valves, special valves in their arteries that keeps all the blood from rushing to their head. And also, um, they don't have as much blood as we do. So that's just that volume of blood is so much less. They, uh, they'll wrap their wings around their body when they're hanging upside down and that helps them retain body heat. So it's kind of like, like a warm little blanket they can wrap around themselves. Just like you do when you're cold, you might you know, hold your arms together and, and rub. That's exactly what the bat's doing. It's wrapping those wings around itself. It's holding in that body heat. Now, hanging upside down for a bat is super easy. So they have an adaptation in their, in their claw that helps them do this. Now, if you think about your fist, your hand, if you were to go to a jungle gym and you were to hang from your hands by a, one of the rungs and hang your body weight there, that gets hard real fast. You have to, you have to um, contract your muscles. Your muscles are attached to tendons and you have to expend a lot of energy to keep that fist tightly closed. Now in bats, that tendon is connected directly to their upper body. It's not actually connected to muscles. So the bat has to expend energy to open its, its uh, foot. So it'll open its foot, but then when it, when it grabs a hold of something, all it has to do is relax. And by relaxing, the weight of the bat clenches that fist closed and it locks it in place. So they actually have to exert energy to release, but not to close. They can hang their clothes. Um, and actually bats that die while they're roosting will continue to hang there until they get jostled loose. So pretty amazing. So let's talk about that, that flight. So birds, basically fly with their hands, or sorry, bats basically fly with their hands. So their wing is much different than a bird wing. So a bird wing, as you can see down here, and this is from uh, How Stuff Works, a bird wing is a very rigid structure and the muscles, the main flying muscle that moves the bone is basically on the shoulder. It's where the, the wing connects to the body. Now a bat wing is more flexible. So in a bat wing here, is the shoulder, this is the elbow essentially, and then this part where this little hook is, is the wrist. And these long bones that, that holds the wing, those are the fingers. So it's a lot like a hand, but it's got the membrane between the fingers and that makes them much more maneuverable. I have a video here, it's a little bit longer video than I, than I normally like to use in these programs, but it's, it's an excellent video that really shows you how amazing the, the flying ability of bats is. Let me get to that. Well, I lost something here. I 
lost my control there for a second. There we go. Before we had high speed video, people had this view that bat flight was just kind of a minor variant of bird flight. But what we've found over and over again is how unbelievably maneuverable these animals are. Being able to manipulate their wings and their bodies in such a way that they can adjust and they can maneuver really boggles the mind. A bat wing framed by the skeleton allows bats to have a kind of control over three-dimensional shape that would be impossible for any other kind of flying animal. I'm Sharon Swartz. I study bats how they fly and the structure of their wings. And I'm Kenny Breyer, I'm a professor of engineering and I study animal flight and fluid mechanics. So the collaboration between Sharon's lab and my lab uh, allows us to approach the same problem from two different perspectives. We really find that we can do much more interesting things together than either of us can do by ourselves because we're able to combine aerodynamics with the study of the morphology of the wings. There's a lot of really fundamental differences between the flight of birds and bats. So a bird wing is a relatively stiff airfoil. Bats have a whole hand in their wing and that allows them to change the conformation and shape of the wing with incredible dexterity and precision. So the bones of the part of the wing that's closest to the shoulder, the humerus and the radius have the kind of geometry that we see in birds. But once you cross the wrist joint, we see bones that are less mineralized and that makes that bone itself less stiff. It actually promotes bending. We don't usually think of skin as being a muscular organ, but the skin of the wing membranes of bats is invested with a whole series of muscles. And what we observe is that the muscles turn on and off in every wing beat cycle. And so these muscles can change the stiffness of the skin in the wing membrane. And so that means the muscles change the aerodynamic properties of the airfoil. And that's completely different from a bird in, in the way in which it operates. It, it bends, it flexes, it, it puffs out. So they're able to continue to generate lift even as they're moving more slowly. So when we first started, really very little was known about the precise nature of bat flight. We're really interested now in how the animal uh, has evolved to generate these kinds of forces and motions. What can we learn about thrust, about lift, about unsteady flight mechanisms, about muscle activity? And, and we design these experiments at each stage just to move ourselves forward. So when we do our tests, we use two facilities. One is a, a flight corridor, which is just a room. We have our cameras set up in there. Just being able to see in detail how bats move their wings has turned out to give us a lot of insight. Uh, the other one is this wind tunnel. The equivalent of a treadmill for a flying animal. We take high resolution, high frequency motion of the wings from multiple angles and we reconstruct the, uh, the kinematics of the motion that way. And then we fill the wind tunnel with, with a cloud and we record the motion of the particles of that cloud. And from that we can reconstruct the wake. And that lets us learn a lot about how it uses the wings to produce aerodynamic forces. Once we've taken measurements with the, with the animals, we recreate aspects of that using engineered robotic flapping wings that we test in the wind tunnel. And there we can do things that we can't ask the animals to do. And it does provide a lot of, of, of inspiration and ideas of things that we might try for building robotic flying vehicles. So one of the things that bats do extremely well is landing. They have to slow down, they have to flip themselves upside down and land hanging onto the ceiling or hanging onto a, a tree roost. It's like doing a, a, a high dive backwards. 
What we found is that during the last two wing beats of a bat preparing to land, there's almost no aerodynamic force produced. They also use the, the mass in their wings to manipulate their body, uh, and that controls their rotation in the same way that a high diver controls her rotation when they dive. The bats are incredibly agile and maneuverable, and they're very resistant to perturbations in the air, to gusts. If we want to understand how bats are able to do this so well, we have to have some way of providing a gust to the animal in the lab and then seeing what it does in detail. We have two sets of laser crossbeams here, so that when the bat flies through, the bat breaks the laser beams. That sends a trigger signal. The air jet delivers a puff of air, and we can capture all of that in high-speed video from above and below using an array of high-speed cameras. We find that even really strong gusts of wind, they recover stability in less than a single wing beat. And so what we're trying to understand now is what are the mechanisms that they use to recover so quickly? What is it about the properties of the body and the wing that might return control passively? And how much is active? The uh, ability to, to do these experiments really gives us a unique insight as to how these animals move and maneuver, and also just how they evolve. I mean, what is the evolution of flight in mammals? I think that we understand enough now about how flight works, where we can look at the origin and diversification of that flight. It's a beautiful evolutionary laboratory. I love those moments where you've recorded something that no one has seen before. A moment of insight into the natural world. It doesn't matter how tiny it is. There's nothing like that. Some pretty cool stuff, I gotta say. You know, you... You combine bats and lasers and high-speed cameras, and you got something something pretty cool. So echolocation. Now this is a, another thing that bats are known for. Right, the blind as a bat is a common phrase, but bats actually see just about as well as any, any mammal. Um, so it's a kind of a misconception based on the fact that bats are nocturnal, so they're usually out during the night. And a, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them will use echolocation and have excellent hearing. So what they do is they send out this sound wave um, and it, goes out and it bounces off objects and it returns to the bat's ears. And they can determine the size, the shape, the location, the direction, the speed of objects that those sound waves bounce off of. They can actually detect something as thin as a human hair um, or small insects like mosquitoes, so they, which they, they love to eat. So pretty cool stuff. Um, somebody asked, why do bats in my neighborhood seem to hang around the street lights? I would guess that because the street lights attract the insects. So the bats are not then attracted to the light. They're actually attracted to the insects that are flying around that light. Now, there are some health risks that are associated with bats. Um, bats actually have a very high tolerance for viruses. And this is thought to be because when they're flying, their body temperature goes up. Um, so they have a high tolerance for viruses. Some of them um, affect them like rabies. Rabies can kill bats um, and they can carry rabies only about 5% though. So usually, you know, we're, you gotta be careful. I wouldn't, you know, I would take precautions and try not to get bit. Oh, let me make sure that I'm sharing the right, there we go. Sorry, somebody pointed out that I had the wrong thing shared. So thank you for that. So they can uh, carry viruses. Um, only about 5% of tested bats carried rabies. Um, and yes, there is some suggestion that they can carry coronavirus or even this current coronavirus. But I really want to emphasize this. Um, if we leave them alone, we reduce the risk of transmission. 
So the, when those viruses um, make the jump from animals to humans, it's because we put ourselves in a position where they could happen. We're hunting them, maybe we're eating them, we're doing things that puts us in close contact with them and then allows those viruses to, to make the jump to humans. Um, somebody said, why can't we hear the sound that bats make? You actually can, it's, but it's very high pitched. So it's a very high pitched sound. So it can be difficult to hear. It sounds like a little, almost like a little squeaking. Um, the other health risk associated with bats is histoplasmosis. Histoplasmosis is actually caused by a fungus found in, in bat droppings primarily in, and it's primarily found in the area drained by the Mississippi and Ohio rivers. And usually takes about two years um, for the droppings and the fungus to build up enough to the point at which it can become a health hazard. Um, people con contract this by inhaling spores from the fungus and that's usually from a disturbed roosting area or when cleaning up droppings. And it can cause flu-like symptoms generally pretty mild in most people, but in rare cases, it can become serious and cause some serious illness. Um, somebody asked about having a bat house in the backyard, good idea or not. I say good idea, and we're gonna talk about bat houses at the very end. So some of the benefits associated with bats, um, one is insect control. So. Since they eat up to a 600 insects an hour, now multiply that by you know a whole bunch of bats flying around, that means a lot less insects, a lot less insects that can damage crop, crops. So the, the estimated value of bats for insect control is, has been estimated at about $3.7 billion a year. So that's, that's a significant uh, financial savings. Um, bats also support complex cave ecosystems. So some of those cave ecosystems where bats roost, there's a lot of very unique creatures in there. And they really rely on the bats to bring in some organic material, usually in the form of, of bat poop or what, you know, what's known as guano. So bat guano is just bat poop. And bat poop, like I mentioned earlier, bat guano is better fertilizer than cow manure. And so fun fact, before oil was discovered in Texas, Texas's biggest export was bat guano for fertilizer. Um, pollination and seed dispersal. So nectar and fruit eating bats pollinate many species of plant and many species will um, depend on them um, to, to disperse their seeds. Um, somebody asked, can people have pet bats? Um, not a good idea. I will tell you that my, my dad, when he was in college, had a bat that he kept in a shoebox. Um, but no, I don't recommend it, and I'm pretty sure it's not legal. So yeah, don't keep a bat as a, as a pet. Um, food for other species. So like somebody was asking earlier about um, predators of bats. Um, bats are eaten by hawks, falcons, owls. Uh, weasels, raccoons, ring-tailed cats, pretty much anything that can get a hold of them will eat them. And then, of course, they're, they're inspiration for technical innovations. Like you saw in the video, um, they're working on understanding how bats fly, how maneuverable they can be. That gives them ideas for maybe um, some, some sort of drone or some sort of flying machine that can be that maneuverable. Um, their, their echolocation provides insight for um, sonar systems and things like that. Now bats have a lot of threats, um, not just predator threats, but, but other threats to their, to their um, continued livelihood. Um, climate change is a big one. So heat waves and droughts um, can cause overheating. It can cause a lack of food. Um, wildfires that are driven by by climate change can cause habitat damage. Um, intense storms that are get, being driven by climate change can cause flooding of cave and mine um, roosting areas. So early season snows or prolonged cold can trap bats in those caves and, and cause, them, cause them to die. Um, so I have a, a Facebook question about bat migration. 
Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna get into a little bit of bat migration when we when we talk about um, some of the species here in Nebraska. Um, so habitat loss. So bats like to roost in those caves and mines and quarries, and some of those things are being are being developed. Some of those areas are being developed. Um, they they roost in hollow trees or under tree bark, and you know if those areas are destroyed because they're developed, then they're losing habitat. Um, white nose syndrome is a big problem with a lot of our bats. So white nose syndrome is a fungal disease that primarily affects cave dwelling bats um, and insectivores. And this has actually been a big problem. It's killed millions of bats and up to 99% of some populations, not species, but pop, you know, isolated populations. So what this white nose syndrome does is it it causes bats to wake up during their hibernation. And if they wake up during hibernation, well, then their, you know, their metabolism is gonna increase, they're gonna need to eat, they might not have food. And so it causes a lot of problems. Um, and sadly, because I like clean energy, wind turbines are actually a threat to bats. Now they're not really sure what happens in these instances. Um, some theories are that they mistake the trees for, or they mistake the windmills for trees, or they mistake the, the shiny surface for water, and then they, they get hit by the, the blades. Um, during migration, a lot of times bats won't use echolocation because they know the routes. So if there's a, a wind farm that is erected in their migration route, well, maybe they, um, maybe they, they don't expect it to be there, or maybe they're just curious. Now there is some things that, that can uh, mitigate the risk to bats when it comes to wind turbines. Um, somebody said, are the bladeless ones better, the circular ones? I'm not sure. I would guess so, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, one, one way they can mitigate those um, dangers to bats is by having the blade start at a, a slightly higher uh, wind speed. So if they start at a slightly higher wind speed, that reduces bat mortality by 50 to 60%. So that's, that's um, a significant amount. And also there are acoustic deterrents. So there are sounds that they can play that will repel the bats or, or keep them from going into those areas. So there are some steps that we can take to mitigate those risks for the bats. Now, some of the bats of Nebraska, there's, like I said, there's about 13 species in Nebraska. One of our year-round residents is this, this guy, the big brown bat. So this is uh, an insectivores. All of our, our Nebraska bats are, are insectivores. Um, they like to roost in hollow trees. Um, they will roost in buildings and attics, which of course we don't necessarily like, but there are, are ways to keep them out. Um, somebody asked if there are bats in Fontenot Forest. Yes, bats like to live near water. So we have the river here, we have our wetlands, we have, we have lots and lots of bats. Um, in eastern Nebraska, big brown bats will, will use um, rock quarries or hollow trees for their winter refuges. And I have here a mounted specimen of a big brown bat. So you can see when we say big, we're talking about something that's not quite as big as my hand. So big brown bat, yes, you know, super big brown bat, not so much. Now let's get back to the PowerPoint. Now this little guy is the little brown bat. So the little brown bat is the smallest and most widely spread bat in North America. So they're found in the eastern uh, quarter of the state um, and in the northwest corner, so the, or the eastern, the eastern quarter of the state and then up in the northwest corner, kind of up in the panhandle. They, around here, they will hibernate in, in rock quarries along the Platte in Cass and, and Sarpy County. Um, now their population is one that's been extremely hard hit by white nose syndrome, so they are their population has really decreased um, over the years due to white nose syndrome. Um, and somebody pointed out to me, I, I said the other day to one of my coworkers who knows a lot about bats, yeah, I saw a bat in my backyard, I wondered what it was. And she pointed out identifying bats 
in flight is almost impossible. So it, it could have been almost any of the species that we have around here, though some are a little more rare. Now this pretty little guy is a, an Eastern red bat. So they're found in, in wooded habitats. They're more common in the Eastern half of Nebraska. And this is one of our migratory species. So they, they show up here um, usually in uh, April, depart in November. Um, but what I looked up was that they don't really know where they winter at. So they will hibernate. Eastern red bats will hibernate in other areas, but for some reason here, they're migratory. Um, somebody asked if there is a treatment for white nose syndrome. There, there is some things they can do to mitigate it that involve um, sometimes um, either using natural or um, other fungicides to, to kill it off in the roosting area or on, you know, on the bat, but it's hard to deliver those things um, en masse to the bats without harming the bats. So our Eastern red mat, bat is migratory and they'll give birth to between two and five pups in late May, early June. So we're coming up on bat birthing season here pretty soon. And they'll roost in the, in, the, in the trees and they'll look like because of their coloring, it kind of disguises them as um, dead leaves or fruit. So they kind of hide that way. Um, my coworker told me I needed to include the hoary bat, and I see why because they're they're very cute looking. They're very pretty. They're kind of a brown. They have this silver or white tip fur, which kind of looks frosted. And these occur statewide. And again, this is another migratory species. They arrive in May um, and depart in in October. They're they're a solitary bat, so they'll roost either singly or in family groups. And, and the mother usually has twins. So they're just a, a pretty neat bat. Um, the northern long-eared myotis. These are um, found in northeastern or in eastern Nebraska along the Niobrara and Republican rivers. And these are frequently captured in Fontenelle Forest. So, you know, somebody asked if we have bats here. This is actually one of the bats we have here. And I was reading a, a paper on the bats of Nebraska, and granted, it was a it was a little bit dated. It was from 1997, but it was from the University of Nebraska out in Lincoln. And and what the quote was, one of the quotes about the long-eared myotis was, most information about the species in Nebraska comes from bats netted in Fontenelle Forest. So I thought that was pretty cool. Now that's like I said, it's a little bit dated information. I'm I'm sure they've found out more from more places, but pretty cool to get mentioned. Um, during the day and summer, they're gonna shelter under loose tree barks, um, also shutters or wooden shingles, they might go under there on your house. Um, and, and again, they, they like to hibernate in those caves and mines and quarries along, along the river here in Sarpy and Cass County. Now, bat houses. We had a question about bat houses and is it a good idea? Absolutely. I would absolutely. I have a bat house. Um, I didn't get a chance to put it up, but I need to do that. So on the left here, we have what's called a traditional bat house. This is kind of that traditional design, kind of rectangular and thin. And on the right, this is called a rocket box. I think this is a really neat one. So these two designs have a, a very high success rate of attracting and uh, maintaining bats. And it's because they mimic the types of crevices found under, under loose tree bark and places that, that those types of bats like to roost. Um, best placement for a bat house is between 12 and 20 feet high. They like to be a little bit higher off the ground to keep bees safe from predators. Um, usually 20 to 30 feet from any other tree or structure. And that helps keep them, again, safe because something can't come from a, another tree jump over. Um, so putting them on a pole like you see here with these is a good way to do it. Or you can put it on the, the side of your house. Um, usually the southeast side is best because then it gets the warmth of the morning sun. Um, if you're near a stream or a lake or a pond or some source of water, you usually have better success or, or at least 
it doesn't take them as long to find it. And that's because those, those water sources not only are you know, water for them to drink, but water sources like that attract insects, which is, of course, food. All right, that's all I have today. If you'd like to become a member of Fontenelle Forest or make a donation, please visit our website or call our front desk. Um, I do uh, presentations like this generally for groups, generally at uh, senior homes, senior centers, things like that. So if you're interested in information on that, on pricing or a catalog of topics, feel free to contact me here at the forest. And then of course, with all this quarantine stuff, um, Fontenelle Forest wasn't able to do our traditional big fundraising events, but we do want to thank our sponsors. Um, these are our sponsors that help make it possible for us to continue to keep our trails open to members during this time. Um, to continue doing programming um, like this. So um, support them, give them a thumbs up, thank them for, for supporting us. And that's, I can try to answer any questions that anybody might have. And again, thank you for, for tuning in today. Um, this was, this is always a good time. All right. Do bat attractants work for bat houses? Uh, there's some limited success with that. Um, what I read said that a, attractant, they're more attracted to the structure itself rather than any sort of attractant. Um, how would I know if they utilize my bat house? Um, you'd probably find some guano underneath it, or if you uh, watched in the evening, you might see them emerging. Um, that'd be the, the best way I would think. Um, how many bat species are there? Worldwide, there's over 1,100 bat species. So there are, there are a lot of different species. Um, only about 45 here in the United States. So if you think about that, we've got 45 here, uh, but worldwide, there's over 1,100. A lot of them live in the rainforests, um, some of those tropical, more tropical areas. All right, well, if there's no more questions, I'm gonna say goodbye and we will see you in a couple of weeks. I'm not sure what we'll, what we'll talk about in a couple of weeks, but we'll definitely talk about something. So keep an eye out for that. Thanks a lot. Hey, Tim, can you hear me? Yeah, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah this is Lauren Paddleford. I'm wondering how you, how do you put a message on this little chat board here? Um, if you're on Zoom, if you look at the bottom, there should be, you might see a couple of three dots that say more. And if you click on that, you should see an option for chat or you, oh, there's a chat button at the bottom of your screen if you're on Zoom. Okay, yeah, I did that. I, I typed in a message button and I can't figure out how to get it on the, <laughs> up on the oh. uh, screen, screen here. Um, if you hit return, did you, or is there a send button? Or hit return. And somebody asked how bats rear their young. Um, so they'll, the, the baby bats will nurse from the mother and they'll, they'll hang there with them or cling to the mother's chest. Uh, Tim, what I wanted to say was that uh, was that information about the bats in front of the forest can be viewed on Nature Search. They're also written up on Nature Search. Oh yeah, I, I, that's a great that's a great point. Thank you. So Nature Search, and you can access that from the the Fontenelle Forest website. Yes, um, is a great resource. And um, 
the other thing is that uh, we we when we go down to uh, um, Camp Wakanda and that uh, the shelter there, they uh, the bats uh, shelter in those those uh, in those shelters, and uh, you can see the evidence of it from the guano they leave in there. But last few times we've been there, we haven't been able to find them during the day. We thought that they would be um, roosting there during the day. They seem to come there momentarily. They deposit a little bit of guano and then they're gone. They're not there during the day. We can't figure out where they go. Huh. Yeah, I don't know. I had thought about that too, that I thought those shelters would be great bat roosting sites. But yeah, I, I was checking them out uh, just about a week ago and I didn't see any either. But I've, I have seen bats in my backyard in the last week or so. Yeah. Well, thank you for the program. You're welcome. All right, everybody have a good day. Thank you.